what to do in times of trouble. Anybody ever been going through a time of trouble? Anybody going through some trouble right now? Anybody know anyone who's going through some troubled times? I want to have you open your Bible with me to the book of Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to answer the question, what do you do in times of trouble? What do you do in desperate times? Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. Look here with me, and I think there's no better way to answer this question. When we ask the question, what do you do in times of trouble? I think there's no better place to look than to a mother who knows what to do in times of trouble. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 22, behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region, and she cried out to Jesus, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. My daughter is vexed by a demon. Whatever translation you're reading out of, it is clear that this woman's daughter was oppressed, possessed, attacked by Satan. And this mother just wasn't going to take it anymore. And this mother was going to do whatever it took to deal with this situation so that she could ease the suffering of her daughter that she loved. And the Bible says that, that love never fails, that faith works through love, that there's something very powerful about compassion. Every time that Jesus did a miracle in the Bible, almost every time we have recorded, it's always accompanied by love or compassion. It says, and Jesus having compassion upon them fed the multitudes. And Jesus, having compassion upon them, healed the sick. And Jesus, having compassion upon them, cast out the devils. And Jesus, having compassion upon them, touched the coffin and, and raised the boy up from the dead and gave him back to his mother. Jesus did miracles on the heels of his compassion and his love. He didn't do miracles to try to prove that he was God. He did miracles because he was moved by his love and compassion for people. God doesn't want to see his people hurting. And this mother did not want to see her child in pain and her child suffering and her child hurting. There's no mother on the face of this earth that wants to see her child in torment or in pain. And I think we can learn a lot from this woman. All of us, male, female, and anything in between can learn a lot from this woman, this mother, who would go to great lengths to see her daughter eased and healed of her pain. Can anybody say amen? amen? What did this mother do in her time of trouble? Well, I think the first thing that we need to see is that she says to Jesus, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Now, I think every mother here and every father, for that matter, loves their children. And we never like to think that the problem is with our child. If you're called into the school that your kids go to, you never want to feel like they're telling you that it's all because of your child. The worst thing you can do when you're called into the school, the worst thing you feel is that, that, if, that, 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 that something has hurt your child or that your child has done something wrong. And so the first reaction we have when the principal wants to tell you about an incident at the school that has to do with your child, the first thing we, want, the first thing we usually do is get defensive because we don't want to feel like it was our child that did it. We don't want to feel like it was our child that made the mistake. We don't want to feel like it was our child that did the wrong. We always want to look for blaming something or somebody else. But you know, there's never any growth when we live in denial about our situation that we're in. And, and really, I'm giving you a picture. I'm using this illustration of this mother and how she dealt with her trouble and how she dealt with her problem. But this, this applies to all of us with any situation that we ever face. The first thing that she did in her time of trouble is she faced things as they were. She didn't live in denial and pretend that it wasn't 
The problem wasn't with her daughter. She said, my daughter is demon-possessed. My daughter has a problem. My daughter is going through something. She wasn't blaming the school. She wasn't blaming the church. She wasn't blaming anybody else. She wasn't blaming the father. She wasn't blaming uh, anybody else. She was willing to acknowledge. Now, of course, she recognized it was the devil, but she didn't pretend that the problem wasn't there. If we're ever going to get out of the trouble that we're in, if we're ever going to overcome whatever problem we're dealing with, if we're ever going to be the champions that God created us to be, if we're ever going to walk in the victory that he created us to walk in, we've got to face life as it is. We don't have to accept it as it is, but we have to face it as it is. You see, the difference is I can face this situation as it is, but I'm not, I'm not going to accept this situation as it is. I'm going to do something about the situation, but I'm going to face reality. I'm not going to live in denial. I think the first problem that anybody has with an addiction or the first problem anybody has with a sin, a habit, a mistake they've made is to live in denial about it. If something's going on in your life, we got to get out of denial. We got to break out of denial. My daughter is demon possessed. My husband is a devil. My husband is Satan himself. Whatever the problem is, admit it. My husband's head spins around and green stuff comes out of his mouth all the time. Lord, deliver me. Face it as it is. Don't accept it as it is, but face it as it is. Right? I can face it without embracing it. Face it, don't embrace it. Admit it, but don't commit to it that that has to be your lot in life the rest of your life. Are you with me still? The first thing she did was she, she broke out of denial. I'm not going to pretend the problem isn't there. I'm not going to pretend I don't have this addiction. I'm not going to pretend I don't have this financial problem. I'm not going to pretend I don't have a bad attitude. I'm not going to pretend that I'm bitter. I'm not going to pretend that I'm angry. I'm not going to pretend. I'm going to face it. I'm not going to embrace it, but I am going to face it. And that's how we break out of it. Now, in Mark's depiction of this story in Mark chapter 7, verse 25, I want you to see the next thing she did in her time of trouble. It's in Mark's version, and then we'll come back to Matthew's version, but in Mark's version of Mark chapter 7, verse 25, anybody ever been through a time of trouble? You got to face it as it is. Don't embrace it as it is, but face it as it is. Don't live in denial. Don't pretend it's not there. If there's a problem, admit it, and then Go to Jesus to do something about it. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, when she heard about him, she came to him and fell at his feet. Notice what it says. As soon as she heard about him, she came to him. Now, I don't know what direction she was going in prior to this moment. I don't know which direction she was facing at this moment. But as soon as she heard about him, she turned to him and she came to him and she fell before him. She turned to him, she came to him, she fell before him. Now, if you'll do that in your time of trouble, that is, a, that is gonna take you a, a whole long way out of that trouble. It's gonna take you a whole lot further down the road than you've ever been before. When you hear about him, she heard about him, she came to him, and she fell before him. In other words, she knew where to turn in her time of trouble. So many of us turn to others who can't really do anything about our situation. Some of us turn to, to social media to do something, to, to, but yet just because somebody is your friend on Facebook doesn't mean they're your friend in life. We can't turn to people who have no vested interest in our well-being, who have no stake at, in our well-being, who have, who have no, uh, no skin in the game of our lives. We can't expect that they're going to be our answer in times of trouble. No matter who's promised you something in life, you can't rely on somebody else's promises. When we are in a time of trouble, we got to turn in the right direction. We got to turn towards him. We got to turn to him. That's really what repentance is. It's turning to the Lord. It's turning from where we are, the direction we're going in, turning to the direction we want to go in, turning from the people we relied on, turning to the Lord who we can always rely on, turning from trusting people's promises promises and turning to trusting God's promises. That's where it begins. This woman knew where to turn. As soon as she heard about him, she didn't go through all these religious questions. Well, but is he really the one? Is he really? When you're desperate, 
When you're hurting, when you're in trouble, you lose all your religion, don't you? It's like we don't, we, you lose all your theology. When you're in trouble, you don't start... You, you don't start arguing with theological debates. When you're in times of trouble, you go run into Jesus. That's what this woman did. She didn't have a debate. She didn't say, am I a Baptist? Am I a Pentecostal? Am I charismatic? Am I Catholic? I'm not sure. Can I really expect my daughter to be delivered? She didn't care about denominations and names and titles. All she knew was Jesus had showed up, and she wanted something from him. She needed something from him. And bless God, she was going to get something from him and not leave there without her miracle. Can anybody say amen. amen. Boy, she was just so smart, and we can learn so much from her. She didn't turn to friends. She turned to God. I'm not saying that we don't need friends. We do. But I'm saying that our friends cannot produce the miracle that Jesus paid the price for, only going to the cross, only going to the blood, only standing under the spout where the glory comes out, standing under the spout where the blood comes out, standing under the spout where healing flows, where miracles flow. It's standing at the cross. It's taking up our cross. It's realizing it's at the cross of Jesus where miracles happen. It's at the cross of Jesus where, where forgiveness takes place. It's at the cross of Jesus where deliverance happens. It's the cross that Satan hates. It's the cross that Satan despises. It's the cross that Satan is afraid of. So every time we remember the cross, every time we go to the cross, every time we talk about the cross, every time we say it is finished, Satan flees. This woman knew where to turn. She turned to Jesus in her time of need. She turned to the cross in her time of need. She turned to the man who was going to go to the cross soon. And she looked to the one who she could trust in. What an example that we can, that we can take and draw from in this woman's life. Go back to, going back to Matthew chapter 15, verse 22, the next thing she did in her time of trouble is notice what she says to Jesus when she cries out to him. She doesn't say, I've done all the things necessary for you to heal my daughter. She doesn't say, have you seen my daughter's report card? She doesn't say, have you seen all the prayers we've prayed. She doesn't say, have you seen how holy I've been? She doesn't say, have you seen how godly I've been? She doesn't say, don't you realize how much I've sacrificed to get here and to stand here in front of you and to sit here at your feet? She doesn't say any of those things. She simply cries out, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. It's not because we deserve it that God heals. It's not because we've earned it that God heals. It's not because we've worked enough for it that God heals. He heals because of his mercy. He delivers because of his mercy. We got to stop going to God on the basis of what we've accomplished and what we deserve, and we got to go to God on the basis of mercy. What do, what do we do in times of trouble? Ask God for mercy. Ask God for his help. Ask God to come through. Ask God to, 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 to forego the judgment that you deserve and to give you the healing that you don't deserve. Go to the throne of his grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. She didn't say, have law on me. She didn't say, have rules on me. She didn't say, have principles on me. She said, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. There is no appeal to him on the basis of her religion. There is no appeal to him on the basis of her holiness. There is no appeal to him on the basis of how often she prayed. There is no appeal to him on the basis of how much she's done for him. There is one appeal and one appeal only, and it is for mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. I know we don't deserve this. I know we deserve. I don't know what I did. I'm sure I've contributed to why my, de my daughter is demon-possessed. I'm sure she's done something wrong, and that's why she's demon-possessed. I'm sure we let the Satan in somehow. We don't know, but but Jesus isn't asking that question. What did you do wrong that allowed the devil in? Jesus isn't dealing with what, are, what rules did you break? What sins did you commit? What, 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 what addiction did you have? No, she goes to him not on the basis of rules. She goes to him not on the basis of religion. She goes to him on the basis of mercy. What do you do in your time of trouble? Do you give God your report of everything you've done? Or do you go to him and say, mercy, mercy, mercy? A soldier in France had betrayed the emperor Napoleon, and 
he was about to be hanged in the gallows for being a traitor, for betraying the great emperor. And the mother of this man found her way to the feet of Napoleon, the emperor, before her child was just about to be hanged. And she said, oh, great emperor, have mercy on my son. You're about to hang him. Have mercy on him. Napoleon looked at her and he said to her, woman, have mercy on your son? Do you realize his crimes against this nation? Do you realize his crimes against this kingdom? Do you realize his crime against, do you realize his crimes against me? Do you realize his crimes against his fellow soldiers? He doesn't deserve mercy. He deserves to be hanged and that's what we're going to do. And the mother of this man looked at Napoleon and he said, oh, great, and she said, oh, great emperor, I realize he deserves to be hanged. But if he deserved to be let go, it wouldn't be mercy at all. Have mercy on him today. At that moment, the emperor had a change of heart. He set the man free because his eyes were opened to what mercy really is. It's when we don't get what we deserve. You think about the things we've done in life. I think about the things I've done in life. I got one, one huh about me, but you need to huh yourself today, right? I think about all the things I've done. I think about the things, you can think about the things that you've done and what I deserve for my mistakes and what I deserve for my sins. Well, we all deserve hell, but because of his mercy, he doesn't send us there. Because of his grace, he makes a way for us to go to heaven. Because of his mercy, he prevents us from going to hell. Because of his grace, he gives us heaven. Because of his mercy, he protects us from hell. In other words, grace is what God gives us when God gives us what we don't deserve. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. We deserve judgment, but he doesn't give it to us. That's mercy. This soldier deserved to die, but the emperor had mercy on him by removing his sentence of death against him. God have mercy on me. She must have known. Look, we don't, we deserve, <laughs> knowing my lifestyle and knowing that she doesn't have a husband with her. Maybe, maybe she's left him. Maybe he left her. Maybe she, did, maybe she was never married. Maybe this is a single mother. Maybe this is a mother who had this child outside of marriage. Maybe this mother had committed immorality and had this child, but that child is hers nonetheless. Amen. And she knows that even though whatever I did in my life, I deserve for my daughter to be in this condition. Really, Lord, I deserve myself to be in this condition for what I've, for what I've done. So she doesn't go to God with, you better heal her because you're the healer. She says, have mercy. Have mercy. You know, when you go through the Bible, the number one cry of the people whenever they got healed was have mercy, Jesus. Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus on the road, he heard about Jesus. Have mercy, O Lord. Have mercy, son of David. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And he was healed. The ten lepers, have mercy on us, son of David. And he was healed. They were healed. And this woman, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. And she was, her daughter was healed, as we'll see. It's mercy, it's mercy, it's mercy. You want to experience deliverance from trouble? Don't talk God, don't try to talk God into why you deserve it. Talk, don't even, you don't have to talk God into anything. Just go to him and say, mercy, mercy. 
Have mercy on me. Mercy is not, it doesn't have anything to do with the law. It doesn't have anything to do with right and wrong. It doesn't have anything to do with do I deserve it. Mercy is the desire and the willingness to alleviate the pain that the person is going through, to alleviate the grieving and the pain and the suffering to alleviate them of their hurt, to alleviate them of their pain. And when she says, have mercy on me, she's saying, alleviate us of our pain even though we don't deserve it. Alleviate us of our pain even though we probably deserve the pain. Alleviate us from it. Heal us from it. Deliver us from it. Have mercy on us. How many times have we gone to God on the basis of what we deserve and we're blind to the reality that we really don't deserve anything except judgment. But thank God, he said, go boldly to the throne of his grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. What do you do in your time of need? What do you do in times of trouble? You face life as it is, even though you don't accept it as it is. You turn to the right source and you turn in the right direction to Jesus and you ask for mercy because it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it, it, there's no other route, there's no other road that it's coming down except Mercy Avenue. Amen. Mercy. Mercy. You say, yeah, but doesn't God heal us only if we first fix what we're doing wrong? But here we have a woman who recognizes she hadn't done everything right. And with the man that was lame for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda, Remember that man? He was lame for 38 years. And the angel would stir up the water and whoever got in there first would get healed of their affliction. And and this man couldn't get in the water because somebody would always go in front of him because he was paralyzed all those years. And he couldn't get in the water. And Jesus comes to him and says, do you want to be made well? And he said, I don't have anybody to put me in the water. And Jesus said, rise and walk and take up your bed and go home. And so the man gets up, the miracle happens, the man gets up, and instead of going home in John chapter 5, the Bible says he actually went to the temple. He went to church after he was healed. He goes, and and listen, that's where we all need to go. Go to church, man. When you've blown it, you know how we used to say to people when they did, when, when they hurt us, we'd say, go to, right? Go to Man, this is the way you got to talk to people now. Man, when you're mad at somebody, say, man, go to church. Man, I just wish you would just go straight to church. Man, I hope you split church wide open, man. I just, oh. get to church. Go to church. Bless God. This guy gets healed, and where does he go? He goes to church. And there in the temple, this is all in John chapter 5, you can look it up later. There in the temple, Jesus finds him in the temple in John chapter 5 and says, you've been made well, I healed you, now stop sinning so nothing worse happens to you. Notice though, he healed him first before he stopped sinning. That's mercy. That's mercy. Sometimes we don't have time to get our lives all straightened out. We don't have time to fix it all up. And even if we could fix it all, that doesn't deserve, we don't deserve healing because we fixed it all. Healing is an act of God's mercy. It's an act of God's compassion. But Jesus did say to him, now you've been made well. Now I healed you. Now go and stop sinning so nothing worse happens to you. In other words, he's saying, look, Your sins are going to catch up with you. Your mistakes are going to have a harvest to them. I'm not judging you, but your own seeds are going to produce their own harvest. You're going to sow bad seeds, you're going to get a bad harvest. It really has nothing to do with God's judgment. It has nothing to do with God's wrath. It has everything to do with you reap what you sow. So he's saying, so Jesus says to the man, stop doing what you were doing because something worse is going to happen. It's going to be worse than just being sick for 38 years. Listen, so see, repentance comes after you experience the goodness of God. That man experienced the goodness of God, and then he repented, then he turned, then he he went to church. This woman wasn't going to God on the basis of what she deserved. She was going to God on the basis of mercy. God, have mercy on me, 
my daughter is demon-possessed. And isn't it interesting, this mother is feeling everything her daughter feels. She says, have mercy on me. Her prayer is for her daughter, but she's as affected by it as her daughter is, because that's what love is. Love feels what others feel. Love is to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice. And then notice what happens here. She cries out to Jesus, have mercy on me. And then verse 23 says, but he did not answer her a word. My question to you today is, what will you do when it feels like Jesus doesn't answer you a word? What will you do when you face the obstacles of delay, when you face the obstacles that she faced? In fact, she faced several obstacles. She faced the obstacle of race, racism. She was a Gentile, which means she's a non-Jew. She was a Gentile, and it was the Jews that were the seed of Abraham at that time before Jesus died on the cross. The Jews had the right to healing, but the Gentiles didn't. So the disciples were saying, get rid of her. In other words, she's a Gentile. She's not a true believer. She's not a Judaistic believer. She's not a Jew. She's not of Israel. She doesn't deserve the blessing of healing. And yet, so that's racism. So she has, she has people that are showing racism towards her. And then she's a woman. This woman cries out after us, send her away. That's sexism. So she's facing racism. She's facing sexism, and she's facing rejection. At that time, women were considered inferior to men. Not, to God, not in God's eyes, but in man's eyes. And so she faced that sexism. She faced this racism, and then she faced rejection. He didn't answer her a word. What are you going to do when you feel like people aren't treating you right? When you feel like, well, they don't, they don't you know, they, they don't treat me right in that church, or... They don't appreciate my color. They don't appreciate my race. They don't appreciate my, my situation. They don't appreciate that I'm a woman or I'm this or I'm that. Look, this woman faced racism, she faced sexism, and she faced rejection. And you know what she did after they cried out after? She says, send her away for she cries out after us. Verse 24, look at what Jesus said. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, so she, he, she feels he rejects her again. Most of us would leave by then. Most of us would be turning from Jesus and turning to Buddha, turning from Jesus and turning to Muhammad, turning from Jesus and turning to some human being, turning to, from Jesus and finding some religion since it doesn't look like he's answering and doesn't look like he wants to do anything for me because I'm a Gentile and look like he don't want to do anything for me because I'm not of the Jewish race. And guess what she did when, after she faced racism, after she faced sexism, after she faced rejection? She came and worshipped him. Let me tell you something. What do you do in times of trouble? I'll tell you what you do. You come and worship him. What do you do when people in the church don't love you? You come and worship him anyway. What do you do when it feels like, well, the church isn't playing my kind of music? Come and worship him anyway. Well, the church isn't taking care of my needs. Come and worship him anyway. Well, the pastor doesn't seem to know that I'm even in the church. Come and worship Jesus anyway. Well, it doesn't seem like this church really is doing what the program that I need. Come and worship him anyway. We got to stop just finding what we we need and we got to start coming to Jesus and worshiping him whether we got our prayer answered or not whether we think he's listening or not whether we feel people's attention or not whether people reject us whether people lie about us whether people betray us what if we could all stay in the church family even when we feel like no one's listening even when we feel like there's racial tension even when we feel like maybe I'm not treated the same way that somebody else is treated or we feel like well I I'm not giving as much as somebody else, so maybe the church doesn't recognize my contribution. Whenever you feel those things, those are the devil's attacks against you to divide you from the very source of your healing. And where will the healing come from? The healing will come when you can push through the rejection, push through the betrayal, push through the church not treating you the way you deserve, and worship him anyway. She came. And she worshiped him. She didn't blame it on the church. She didn't blame it on the pastor. She didn't blame it on her family. She didn't blame it on anybody else. And when he didn't listen, when it didn't seem like he was responding, 
He didn't answer her a word. She worshiped him anyway. So many Christians, they only worship God when they feel good. Or they only worship God so that they can feel good. And we got to stop worshiping him so that we can feel good. And we got to stop just worshiping him because we feel good. And we got to start worshiping him because he deserves to be worshiped. We got to stop worshiping him because we got our theology figured out. And we just got to worship him because he's good. Worship him because he's Jesus. Worship him because he's worthy. Come to church with all of our flaws. All five or six thousand of them, because there's one for every member. We're the problem. All of us are. Come anyway. Worship anyway. Is the pastor going to be on it all the time? Is the pastor going to be on fire all the time? Is he going to give the best word I've ever heard in my life all the time? No. But he's going to give you the word of God. And he's going to pray for your sorry tale all the time. (laughs) And and he's not going to listen to what other people say about you unless unless it's good. So don't listen to what anybody says about me unless it's good too. Amen. She came and worshipped him and said, Lord, help me. Sometimes worship is just three words. Lord, help me. Verse 26. But he answered and said, can you imagine this insult to injury? Kick her while she's down? Would you worship a savior like that? And yet, she worships him anyway, not because he really is like that, but because he's wanting her to pass some tests. Like, are you only going to Are you only going to worship me if I heal your daughter? Are you only going to come to me because you see me feed the multitudes? Are you only going to come to me to give you bread? Are you only going to come to me to tap your head? Are you only going to come to me to get you ahead? Or are you going to come to me no matter what? He said it's not good to take the children's bread. The Jewish people are the children of God at this time before Jesus dies on the cross. Then we all become his children. Anyone who receives him becomes a son of God or a daughter of God, right? But it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. You little dog. He's, he's like, you little. <laughs> you little dog. It's not just that he called her a dog. He called her a little one. It's not just that he called her a little. He called her a little dog. You figure out what, you would, you, what language that's translated into modern-day slang, and, and it's like, whoa. And yet, we don't like the carpet, or we don't like the song, song or we don't like how the pastor walked by and didn't smile or didn't hug or didn't, and we're out of here. This girl, Jesus calls her a little dog. And you know how she responds? I'm out of here. I'm going to Islam, and I'm going to hurt people, man. Forget this. I'm going to be a terrorist. (laughs) Verse 28. Look at what it says. That's the next one. (laughs) Then Jesus... Wait, verse 27. I'm sorry, you guys were right. I was wrong. <laughs> Forgive me. Oh, sensei. And she said, he says, you're just a little dog. Healing's for the children of Israel, not for the Gentiles. Not for you, woman. And she said, yes, Lord. You know what, you know what worship really is? Worship is to agree with God. Look, I don't know if it makes sense, but if God said I'm green and I'm going to agree with him, I'm green. Call me, call me um, my favorite Martian if you want, because I am. If Jesus calls me green, I agree. If Jesus calls me blessed, I agree. If Jesus called me a dog, I agree. She said, yes, Lord, arf, arf. (laughs) But even the little dogs who you just called me, 
I'm going to forgive you for that, Savior. But even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table, and you're still the master. Whether, whether you treated me right or not, you're still the master. Whether I feel loved or not, you're still the master. Whether, you, whether my daughter got healed yet or not, I'm still here to worship you because you are the master. And, she, and Jesus says in verse 28, and Jesus answers and says to her, oh, woman, he elevates her to her true position. Oh, woman, great is your faith. He recognizes her faith and gr how great it is. And he said, let it be done just as you desire. And that, her daughter was healed from that very hour. Her daughter was healed. Why? Because she faced life as it was, because she turned in the right direction to Jesus because she worshiped him when no one else, uh, when, 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 she, when she, he didn't answer her a word, she didn't take no as, a, as the final sentence, she worshiped him anyway, he rejected her, he, she faced the obstacle of rejection, the obstacle of sexism, the obstacle of racism, she overcame it. We got we to gotta overcome those obstacles. And then she agreed with God, fell at his feet, worshiped Jesus, and the Bible says, I will, I will be called whatever you call me. I am who you said I am. I believe what you say I can believe. I can do what you say I can do. I can accomplish what you say I can accomplish. But Lord, you're still the master. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, no matter what I'm going through, in my time of trouble, you are the master. And Jesus said, whoa, you've passed the test. Your daughter is well. Go your way just as you desire. It is done. And from that hour, her daughter was healed. And this mother and this daughter walked in the power of God, the mercy of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God, because in their time of trouble, they worshiped him anyway. And in your time of trouble, come worship him anyway. And Wednesday, come worship him anyway. And Sunday, when you have every reason the devil's whispering in your ear, don't do it, don't do it, come worship him anyway. And watch what God will do. Let's stand together.